National Social Housing Program, cement manufacturers and federal government agree on subsidized cement price. Information and Culture Minister Lai Mohammed says Nigeria is not a failed state. It is all the news aimed at depicting Nigeria as being in a constant state of anarchy. War against banditry and kidnapping, Kaduna based Islamic scholar champions de radicalization program. On Good Morning Nigeria today, we shall discuss COVID-19 resurgence and enforcement of protocols. Claire, you know, since the discovery of the index case of COVID-19 in an Italian in, uh, in national in the first quarter of 2020, the federal government took proactic steps to curb the spread of the virus in the country. Indeed, and uh, of course we, we were familiar with some of those measures that the federal government, you know, took. Uh, I mean, we need to, you know, just remind us of the lockdown. We don't need to remind ourselves of, of the lockdown, restrictions of movement, closing of uh, airports, of course, to prevent further uh, importation of the virus mm. uh, and, and complete, complete shutdown of the economy, really. Mm. Which was sort of, you know you know cause the recent recession we're mm. in but yeah. anyway it's a global thing however the flattening of the curb the fed with the flattening of the curb the federal government reopened the economy including resumptions of international flights with certain conditions to be observed on arrival in nigeria and of course, those conditions would include mandatory PCR COVID-19 testing, and that's after seven days of arrival into the country. Uh, now, but um, of course, uh, there are some, you know, who have refused to comply with the guidelines, and this perhaps um, this contributes to the increase in the number of uh, uh, infections of COVID-19 uh, that we are seeing today, which we have all termed the second wave. And I'm worried about over the situation. Federal government placed travel restrictions on 100 passengers for refusing to show up for the COVID-19 PCR test beyond the stipulated period of seven days after arrival. And of course, um, also in addition to that, the PTF says that they have, those affected passport holders will be suspended from traveling for a minimum period of six months while visas of foreigners who evade the mandatory test would also be revoked. And I should say to me that the, uh, um, the CJS, that's the Controller General of Immigration, has also issued, you know, directive and to ensure that um, these, um, you know, directive is, is, is complied with, is enforced, you know, so that those whose passports have been temporarily halted, mm. you know, do not breach the protocols. I hope they don't. And, you know, experts are also believing the spike in the number of cases may not be unconnected with positive, positive cases of inbound travelers who paid for COVID-19 tests but refused to show up at the testing centers as Nigerians in diaspora returned home for the Yuletide. All right. Um, well, of course, um, we, we will recall that in recent weeks, so many prominent Nigerians, uh, Jimmy, unfortunately, uh, professionals, you know, have also passed on as a result of complications from COVID-19. And mm -hmm. um, just this morning, I was watching one of our programs where uh, the late Professor uh, Femi Odekole, you know, featured in. He was um, one of our very reliable and dependent guests on Good Morning Nigeria. And... Um, the first, you know, professor of criminologies mm. in, in the country. And, um, you know, he passed on from COVID-19 complications and so many, so many others so as well. So many others, you know, you get to only hear those of prominent Nigerians, you know, and personalities. You, you know, there are more deaths out there that you know, a lot of people are not aware. And Precisely. maybe that's the reason why they are not scared of the second wave exactly, which they say is sort of it spreads fast and it you kills know, you, fast. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you, you, you have seen, you know, over the weekend, a popular comedian, in fact, Ali Baba, yes. you know, tweeted, you know, sharing his own, own experience, experience in the isolation center. Who would have thought that <laughs> Ali Baba would, you know? So <laughs> he has a first-hand experience and mm -hmm. he's sharing his experience, yes. you know, out there so that everyone knows that this is real. And indeed, one, you know, particular statement he made is that, look, 
the pastors and the moms who tell you that these things are not real, yeah. uh, you know, he also saw some of them, unfortunately, you know, who, were, who could not make it, you don't. know, alive out of the isolation center. So it is real. COVID-19 is real. It's real. It's, it's real. People just have to believe it. Mm. And in spite of this, Kolo so lost. Some states are still insisting on resuming academic activities this week, thereby disregarding the activities, the directive by the Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19 to suspend reopening of schools till 18th of January. And, that, and, that's, and that's still a matter, a matter of concern, uh, that even though the states are said to be the ones, you know, not testing mm -hmm. and not presenting for testing, they are the same ones that are also flouting the school's reopening yes. uh, rule by the they, federal government. They say they take directives, they don't take directives from the PTF, they take directives from their chief executives. That is what yes, some but, states but, said. Well, there are so many questions, uh, Jume, we will have to ask. And one of those will be, why are we, as Nigerians, not willing to comply with the guidelines for, for safety, uh, you know, and also to adhere to such orders, you know, outside the shores of Nigeria? But what, again, what further actions can be taken to enforce compliance that's on the part of the PTF and also those who are, who are managing the preventive uh, protocols of COVID-19. And this is because more and more people are being infected, including young persons. Young yes, young, young, young persons. So are there, why are some states not taking uh, uh, you know, pre precautions and uh, they're not also complying with uh, the campaign to curb the spread of the virus? And well, th there are so many questions that we that, that bog our minds this morning uh, with regards to COVID-19, the new wave of COVID-19 yes. spread, and of course the is increase in fatalities of, uh, of this disease. More dangerous. Yes. So these are some of the uh, questions we intend to tackle <coughs> again as we take on uh, uh, this uh, discussion this morning on COVID-19 and enforcement of protocols. It's on this note. By the way, I haven't seen you this year, Jume. No, we haven't met <laughs> a whole year. 2020, 2021, it's a long time, you know, yes, and so I kind of missed you. So happy new year. Happy new year. All right, because I have seen, I have seen all of you. Yeah. Yes, we, we had not and I we're here on the 1st of uh, yeah. January. But once again, if you've just joined us for this edition, uh, let's welcome you to a brand new year 2021. I am Claire Adelabo Abdul Razak. Wherever you're watching, stay with us for the next one and a half for there about two hours or so on Good Morning Nigeria. And I am Jumwe Yusuf welcoming you to Good Morning Nigeria. We are reaching you live in Abuja. As usual, our complimentary segments will come in with the newspaper review. But first, let's join Joseph Johnson for the morning news. Good morning, Joseph. Happy New Year. Jumwe, good morning. It's good to see you both again. All right, as part of its determination to ensure the success of the social housing scheme, where the Buhari administration will construct 300,000 houses under the Economic Sustainability Plan for low income earning Nigerians, cement manufacturers have agreed with the federal government to charge discount price, uh, making the disclosure while visiting the completed model houses in Day Day at the federal capital territory. Vice President Yemi Oshibaju affirmed that. It is indeed possible to deliver decent and affordable accommodation that will be within the reach of many Nigerians. We're hoping that, they, uh, that each of these houses will not exceed 2 million naira, which is the target, so that on the average anybody who is earning 30,000 naira a month, if you're ready to spend a third of that amount, there's about 10,000 or less every month, you'll be able to afford one of these houses. Nigeria is not a failed state and cannot be a failing state. Information and Culture Minister Lai Mohammed stated this at a media briefing in Lagos. It is all a news aimed at depicting Nigeria as being in a constant state of anarchy, just so they can achieve their nefarious objectives. If Nigeria was not a failing state, when a large slice of its territory, equivalent to the size of Belgium, was under the occupation of Boko Haram, which collected taxes, installed and deposed areas. Is it now that no territory is under the ter terrorists that Nigeria will be a failing state? 
The federal government has arranged the convener of Revolution Now protest, Omoye Le Shore, and four others before the magistrate court in Wuse Zone 2, Abuja, for allegedly leading a protest against bad governance on New Year's Eve at the Gudu area of Abuja. The five defendants pleaded not guilty to the charges of criminal conspiracy, unlawful assembly, and attempt to incite others against the federal government. Recall that Omoye Le Shore is still under prosecution before federal high court in another matter for calling for a revolution against the government. As far as we are concerned, the left city here, the first opportunity of sitting, court sitting, is only today. And that's why they are here before the court. Oshore was not part of that protest. He was not part of that rally. He just came in and intervened when he saw them beating the Nigerian citizen. And he said, why are you beating these persons? Akaduna based Islamic scholar Sheikh Ahmad Mahmoud Gumi is championing an initiative to de radicalize youth in remote communities of the state and sensitize them on the real tenets of Islam against acts of criminality. This is coming on the heels of the activities of bandits and kidnappers who are making life difficult for the citizenry. People are known to be reserved, have suddenly turn into monstrous uh, people. So there must be a reason. So after studying the reason from clips we see uh, published by the police, Nigerian police, from the people they caught, we understand that they have lack of the basic knowledge about religion. And religion, whatever kind of religion one professes, the Boeing state government has described the video trending on the social media alleging forceful ejection of herders from the state as the work of mischief makers who want to cause disaffection amongst the people. This position was made known after an emergency security meeting between security chiefs and herders in the state. The security chiefs are here. All of them are seated here. There is no such record before government. I want to tell the whole world that the um, Ebony State government is, um, is highly embarrassed by that uh, video in circulation because nothing of such ever existed. 8,000 rural women have benefited from the federal government's 20,000 Naira grant in Kanu State. The beneficiaries drawn from the 44 local government areas of the state are operators of small household businesses. The intervention is part of programs being implemented by the Federal Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development. To provide a one-off grant to some of the poorest and most vulnerable women in rural and semi-urban areas of the country. To appreciate the efforts of the ministry for giving Kano the largest share of this special intervention program. And finally, Nigeria has recorded 1,204 new cases of COVID-19 in 21 states of the country, the highest in the second wave of the pandemic. The latest figure from NCDC indicates that Lagos has the highest of 654, followed by FCT with 200, then Plateau with 60, Kaduna 54, Kanu 40, Rivers 30, Edo 28, while Nasarawa State has 25. Others are KB 19, Bauchi 18, Oyo 13, Akwaibum 12, while uh, Bielsa and Ogun State have 11 each. Nine in Delta, eight in Abia, five in Benue, three in Imo, two in Borunu, while Sokoto and Oshun states have one each. With this development, Nigeria has 91,351 confirmed cases, with 75,699 discharged and 1,318 deaths so far. And that concludes the morning news highlights. Good morning, Nigeria continues with Claire and Jumai after this break. Stay with us.
welcome back to Good Morning Nigeria. Now, the African Union Chairperson Cyril Ramaphosa and Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed have congratulated Africans for commencing trade under the African Continental Free Trade Area. These are more on business news with Timobi Walter in Nigeria. The continental trading under the EFCFTA started on January 1st, 2021. South African President Ramaphosa described the takeoff of the continental project as a fulfillment of the vision of founders of the OAU that is today known as the AU. Our treaty will boost intra-African trade. It will promote industrialization and competitiveness and contribute to job creation, and it will unleash regional value chains that will facilitate Africa's meaningful integration into the global economy. The treaty will also improve the prospects of Africa as an attractive investment destination. Under the AFCFTA trading tariffs on various commodities where rules of origin have been agreed will be drastically reduced and traders of all sizes will have access to a much bigger market than they used to before. Meanwhile, the Central Bank of Nigeria injected $4.37 billion into the foreign exchange market in the third quarter of 2020 as part of efforts to ensure the stability of the Naira with business news Chimobi Walter Naji All right that was Chimobi Walter Naji with the business news sir coming up is newspaper review And Bayo Atiobi is in the studio to review today's papers. Good morning, Bayo. Thank you, Jume. Good morning. Good morning, morning Claire. You know, I always say you're blessed that you're amongst women. <laughs> yes. For Good yours morning, is, Nigeria. For yours is what? The, the, it's the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. Yes. 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 Did you claim that? <laughs> is there any man who is not born of woman? So women are supposed to be revered. They are yes. our mothers. Yeah, mothers. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Exactly. Thank you, Bayer. And good to see you once again. Thank you. Yes. All right. So let's start with the nation. And um, the nation uh, has at its uh, lead story on the front page, government accuses amnesty, ICC, others of fueling insecurity. And the writer to that is Nigeria not failing, says minister. That's the uh, information and culture minister. PDP, global bodies assessment, honest. And that's from the opposition party. And uh, the story trending just tucked in between the headline and the lead story. Obasiki begins defense of certificate forgery. Why um, the picture story this morning uh, is the picture of uh, uh, outside London. Uh, that's, of course, the Waterloo Station deserted as a result of the lockdown pronounced uh, uh, this morning or yesterday uh, by the Prime Minister of uh, UK, Boris Johnson, uh, indicating, of course, that people need to stay at home, uh, but only to go out on, of course, permit to get uh, just a few items or services. And you see some of the Jubilee Line train at uh, Southwark Station in central London, uh, usually a beehive of activity jam-packed. You see that is deserted at the moment. And just below that, London Waterloo Underground Station also deserted uh, because of the renewed lockdown uh, arising from the new strain of COVID-19, which is uh, taking many lives. Other stories trending, England returns to COVID-19 lockdown. That's the caption to those picture stories. Now, Nigeria, 10 others report Africa's 90% COVID-19 cases. And then the, the story is on page six, page five, and on security matters now, bandits kill nine, kidnap 11 on Kaduna Highway. And um, that is bring Gwari local government area of Kaduna. Now, Minister Talon, that's Poland Talon, test negative 
were caught remand Shore and four others. Let me take you a little above the nameplate now. And borders yet to bubble despite Buhari's order. Uh, details of that you can find on page two. Rules scare importers. Rules scare importers. That's quite interesting. Now, Niger monarch, four others. Or would that be Niger monarch, four mm. others, stay with abductors? Uh, details of that on page four. And President, Governors, Mon, ex Unilag VC, as uh, tributes pouring for Eddie Adirinoko, who died at 80. Uh, details of that on page five. Yes, let's now go quickly to the Daily Trust newspaper. You can see the bold headlines there, Claire. Um, bio, real reasons Atiku sold Intel stake with Ryder Buhari after my business interest. That's attributed to the former vice ex-VP. He has nothing to do with your troubles. Responding by the federal, respond by the federal government. We are not bothered. That's from the MPA and exit not a threat to investors' confidence. That's coming from experts. And you can see the graphic illustration of the processes that led to this decision by the ex-VP. Now, above, you know, just below the mass head, Ganduje Shekaro Kwankoso's new romance raises dust about 2023. You find details on page 30. 30. Nigeria owes Eurobond World Bank orders 12 trillion naira. You find details on page 13. Sexual harassment, more trouble for Ogun Commissioner as police insist on probe. You find the details on page 3. And now at the bottom plate of the Daily Trust newspaper, we see stop threatening our troops. Federal government warns ICC and Amnesty International. Reps mom as FG flags off 774,000 jobs today. You find details on page 30. Gunmen kill nine along Kaduna Benungwari Highway. Um, that details on page 9. Bio. Thank you, Jume. Uh, let's start with the issue from the uh, Minister of Information. Uh, he says Nigeria is tackling the challenges from terrorists and bandits internally, but it also faces a third uh, force and that is from human rights uh, groups as well as the International Crime, cr uh, Criminal Justice Court. Minister of Information Lai Mohammed says these challenges has exacerbated the challenges of the nation in the area of security and therefore the minister says to them stop threat to our troops. Lai Mohammed said doomsday prediction about Nigeria will not come to pass. He declared Nigeria is not and cannot be a failed state. Rather, it is a sovereign country. Nigeria will not surrender any of its, or any, to any international organization. He lamented that while Nigerian security agencies continue to ba battle bandits and other terrorists, the ICC and human rights outfit, especially Amnesty International, have become another fighting force. Uh, he says they harass and threaten our security with alleged crimes of war, and a crime against humanity. Nigeria will not surrender its sovereignty to any organization. Meanwhile, the special public works designed to engage 1,000 uh, unemployed persons, especially youths, in the, each of the 774 local government areas of the Federation is to start today. This followed the approval of Mr. President that the Minister of State and Labor, um, uh, Labor and Employment, uh, Festus Kayamo, is to flag off the this uh, program at the old parade ground in Abuja today. The program, you may be recalled, was initially to start on 1st October. But as at present, all NDE st uh, state structures are now ready for the takeoff. Uh, it may be recalled that on 30th of June, there was a face off between the Minister of Labor, uh, Minister of State Labor and Employment, and the Joint Committee of both the Senate and the National Assembly. The committee had questioned why the program was not submitted to it for vetting to ensure input and how the program should be uh, carried out. The Minister of State also asserted that the execution of the program is ultra virus, the powers of the uh, provided in the Constitution for the National Assembly. It was a responsibility of the executive and it has nothing to do with the legislature. The executive uh, relieved the DG NDE of his job and the House of Representatives 
directed that the suspension of the they directed the suspension of the program and also a recall of the DG NDE during its resolution before it went on New Year break. Meanwhile, Daily Trust reports that uh, from all indication, the minister, all ministers are to liaise with their state governors in their respective states in collaboration with the execution of the program. Um, COVID-19, 1,204 new cases were registered yesterday, and unfortunately we lost seven Nigerians to COVID-19. This has brought our total to 91,351. And those that have been discharged are about 75,669. Uh, unfortunately, we have lost 1,318 Nigerians since the COVID started in uh, March 2020. Mm. As of today, 14,339 Nigerians are undergoing treatment for COVID-19. And that is why we all must take uh, observing COVID-19 protocols more seriously. The Federal Capital Authority has sealed off four gardens and uh, parks and they are also prosecuted 12 persons for violating COVID-19 violations. The head of the task force, Atta Ikaro, says that those that were arrested were, pro were, were prosecuted for, for the activities in the parks during the Yuletide period. Meanwhile, like Claire read earlier on, the United Kingdom has mm -hmm. given a new lockdown order that was announced by the Prime Minister Boris Johnson. People are instructed, stay at home. And this, is the, this was made in an eight-minute television address by the Prime Minister. He said that um, cases are rising rapidly in every part of the United Kingdom. Mm. And this is due to the new variant of coronavirus. Schools are now to be closed and all examinations are to be cancelled. This is the third time the United Kingdom is undergoing such a strict national measure. Stay at home is supposed to last up to the middle of February. You know, uh, one, one thing we, we are not sure, we're not certain, mm. is whether what is happening in, in UK is as a result of the variant, the new strain, and what we're having now. Uh, because the, Boris Johnson described, he said, he said, the way the thing is spreading is frustrating and alarming. Yes. So that necessitated the new lockdown. And you, you can see compliance. So Definitely. why wouldn't it is as a result of the new variant. The new variant infects more people more rapidly, and again, it is going down the age range. Mm. Uh, the earlier variant was affecting the elders mostly, especially those with underlying illness. Mm. But this time around, even young people are now affected, and the rapidity at which is, the infection is growing is what is causing the alarm. And why are we not afraid in Nigeria? Why are we not taking We should be concerned, why especially that uh, the nations around the world are very circumspect about any persons coming from the United Kingdom. We should do something about it. The PTF has said something about it. They said they are the serious and concerned about it. However, they don't want to order a ban on flight from the United Kingdom when Nigerians can come in through Benin, Togo, or Niger, Ka or Niger Republic. And therefore, uh, you just come in through the border. But they are also watching very closely to make sure that we protect our Nigerian from this new development. Oh, yeah. Again, I'm afraid you, you won't have enough time to do that. Yeah. Well, yes. I was going to but tell you about three universities have announced dates of resumption. Bayero University, University of Ilori, and University of Benin. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you. And, and I'm happy you. about that. I'm happy about that. But I'll tell you... Don't worry, my daughter will be going back to school. At least I'm happy for that. <laughs> All right, Brian, thank you. Thank, thank you. Too. That's the good news you have given me mm. today. Thank you. So we'll see you again tomorrow. Tomorrow will be another day. Okay. Anyway. All right. So this is Good Morning Nigeria, uh, live on the network service. It's Africa's largest TV network. There's no doubt about that. Uh, we'll be right back. You're welcome back. The non-compliance to COVID-19 protocols by citizens and inbound travelers has become a source of concern to the federal government. This is in view of the increasing number of infections being recorded on a daily basis, hence government's drastic action on defaulters. Kunle Ade put together this report as a background for our discussion. Having flattened the curve of the first wave of COVID-19 in Nigeria, the federal government through the presidential task force on COVID-19 eased various restrictions and eventually opened up the economy and by extension resumption of international flights, but not without some conditions. 
Anyone coming into the country must undergo a mandatory PCR COVID-19 test with some days in isolation also. It is, however, unfortunate that some people do not adhere to these protocols. With the second wave of the virus fully in swing, coupled with glaring evidence like the death of prominent Nigerians and 20 medical doctors, some Nigerians are still not complying with the laid down protocols to curtail the second wave of COVID-19. To enforce these protocols, the federal government recently sanctioned some defaulters with a six-month travel ban on 100 passengers who failed to undergo the compulsory COVID-19 test after their return to the country. According to the PTF, they will not be allowed to leave the country earlier than June 30, 2021. This, some analysts believe, will serve as a lesson to others who will want to violate the guidelines on arrival in Nigeria. So many questions yearn for immediate answers. Are Nigerians still finding it difficult to believe COVID-19 is not real? Or Nigerians are special beings who are resistant to the virus? Why do Nigerians comply with such directives or protocol outside the country and flagrantly violate it here in Nigeria? Have the authorities responsible for implementing the protocol not decisive enough? Answers to these and many more with guests on Good Morning Nigeria in a moment. All right, uh, very pertinent question, uh, Ade Yekunle, you've asked. Well, indeed, we are special breeds, but I don't know if that's the reason why um, we're not complying. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but we'll get to find out that in the course of our conversations. So let me welcome our guests right here in the studio. First, Dr. Sani Aliu, uh, the PTF National Coordinator. We managed to get him here this morning. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. And a compliment of the season. Happy New Year, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> we are also being joined by Professor Abdul Salami Nasidi, former DG NCDC and Provost College of Health Sciences, University of Africa, uh, that's located far away in Bayelsa State. Prof, good to see you once again. Thank you very much. Compliments of the season. Same to you. Uh, we also have here in the studio Iharu Atta, who is Head of Media and Enlightenment, FCT Enforcement Task Force on COVID-19. The masses, the leader of the masses, did you say? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. A wonderful time being with the NGA family. Okay. And we're also being joined via Zoom by Professor Temitope Alonge, former Chief Medical Director, University College Hospital and now Chairman Technical Tax Force on COVID-19 or your state. It's a pleasure to have you join us. My pleasure. Good morning. And also joining us from our JUST studio is Professor Enladi Atu, Secretary to Plateau State Government and Coordinator Tax Force on COVID-19. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Good morning, viewers. All right, uh, gentlemen, welcome once again to Good Morning Nigeria and the Network Service. Let's begin with the uh, PTF National Coordinator, Dr. Sane Aliu. What exactly are we dealing with? We hear second wave, we hear new variants, and we're getting more uh, death rates, uh, you know, increases and more caseloads and all that. What exactly are we dealing with now? So there's no doubt, Claire, the numbers are increasing. Um, if you compare week 52, which was last week, with week 49, so a three-week gap in between, the number of um, cases we're getting uh, weekly has tripled. We were running at around 2,000 a week. We're now running to at around 6,000 cases um, a, week? a week, yes. The test positivity rate back in week 49, three weeks earlier, if we test 100, we get four cases. Now, if we test 100, we get 16 cases. So there's been a significant increase in cases. In fact, the numbers we're getting now far exceed what we had back in May, June uh, last year. And if you remember, when we locked down um, in, in March, April um, last year, we had less than 200 cases a day in the country. So it was much easier to flatten. Now we are actually chasing our tail, uh, partly because of the increased community transmission. The virus has always been with us. It hasn't, it, there wasn't a single day that we reported zero cases since April. In fact, the lowest number of cases was 80-something cases we had at one point. Mm -hmm. And the deaths usually lag behind 
by about three weeks. So what we're seeing now is the impact of the cases we had about two, three weeks ago. We are actually yet to see the impact of the cases we're currently having now. It will take about two, three weeks before we actually start seeing the deaths. Mm. What I wanted to say to the public is, yes, if you are young, and the majority of the cases we get are between 30 to 40, if you are young and you catch COVID, the likelihood is you probably have a mild illness and you'll get better. But if your parents catch COVID, the likelihood is they will get very sick and they could actually die. So it's now no longer a case of just protecting yourself. It's protecting the elderly, it's protecting the vulnerable, it's protecting those groups that will not have a chance if, if, if the virus catches them. You know why I asked what we're dealing with? Uh, because if you look at our records today, we, we have recorded the highest daily uh, cases, 1,204. I think the last time we had such a record was sometime in December, where we recorded, uh, I think, about uh, 1,000 and some fractions. Yes. Um, it, can, can we attribute this to non-compliance with the protocols, or is it the new variant that is you know, causing this havoc? So even if we had a new variant, Claire, if we apply non-pharmaceutical interventions, it's not going to go anywhere. The virus needs an opportunity to jump from one person to the next. And we've been given that virus the opportunity. It doesn't matter whether it's called variant A or variant B or variant C. Or it's the same strain that we've had all this time. Why, did, why were we able to flatten the curve? It was because at the beginning of the epidemic, people actually complied. When we locked down, people stayed at home. When we said wear a face mask, there was a lot more compliance at that time. But now there isn't. So it doesn't matter what strain. We're, we're looking at the moment. Uh, we're working with the researchers to find out exactly w uh, the dominant strain we currently have. But remember, coronaviruses are RNA viruses. They will always mutate. Over the last one year, more than 4,000 mutations have been described um, with coronavirus. It's one of the reasons why we say common cold. Because you catch the cold, you get better. A week later, you come in contact with somebody else with a cold. And again, you, you get a cold because they keep on changing. So mutations are not uncommon with um, RNA viruses. It, it just happened that in the UK and South Africa, they picked up this mutant that has a faster growth rate. But uh, as people were very good at blaming others for, for, our, uh, for, uh, for our weaknesses or our lack of compliance, even if we had the variant strain from the UK or South Africa in Nigeria, if we were complying with non-pharmaceutical interventions, it would not get anywhere. Okay, so what, 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 what happened? Because we, I can't put a finger on how people can just sit down and say, okay, before, under the, before the lockdown, before we were scared, we were following protocols. Now, was, is there any laxity among the people? And did we sort of slack on the awareness? So it wasn't a case of slacking with the awareness. So when it comes to a COVID pandemic, it doesn't have that shock factor that Ebola or Lhasa or some of the other pandemics um, have. I.e. you don't see people bleeding to death. You don't see people falling down in the street. Uh, the majority of people, 80% who get COVID, will actually be fairly well. The mortality rate is about 2%. So you will find people in the community who have never even been in contact with a case of COVID. So unless you work within the health sector or you are, you are very current, you wouldn't even know that there's a major, major problem. The number of people I've come across that tell me, oh yes, I had a bit of a cold and a loss of smell uh, three weeks ago. But the likelihood was that that was probably COVID, but they didn't know. So that you, you, don't, you don't have that shock factor. And in addition to that, um, behavioral change, to sustain behavioral change is so difficult. And the pandemic has been going on for almost a year now. People are tired. People want to go back to normal. We're all social animals. We want to sit down and chat and go to parties, etc. And that's the opportunity that the virus is having. It's just been waiting. And uh, it got the perfect opportunity. It had a good Christmas and a very good uh, 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 a new year. And uh, it's now back with a vengeance because okay. we've given it that opportunity. I hope it will go away before the Easter. Uh, we, 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 really hope so. uh, we, we really hope so, because people are dying. Our, yes. mm. our health institutions, our hospitals, they are starting to get, uh, uh, really uh, get, um, yeah, yeah. Professor Nassidi, I, I would also like you to respond to uh, the question about what we are dealing with. And I ask that question because 
uh, there have been you know patients in, in isolation centers who have reported no prior history of contact or even leaving their homes and who have in fact one of the health officials you know who was very very you know uh, meticulous you know about the protocols came down you know with the virus just recently and that's why I'm asking what exactly are we dealing with is it non-compliance or are we looking at you know as Boris uh, Johnson said a frustrating and alarming new variant of the virus well uh, as the uh, uh, national coordinator had mentioned we might actually be dealing with both you know non-compliance and discipline you know uh, poor attitude to life-saving behaviors uh, you know so uh, this could uh, lead to you know wider spread but definitely the uh, things we're seeing in the last uh, few weeks is uh, what he mentioned but including the fact that there is you know increased transmissibility it seems as if the virus is transmitting faster than before then secondly you know we're seeing that uh, you know even uh, some of the uh, treatment centers that were empty are now beginning to get filled up and not only getting filled up but you know the uh, workers are getting overwhelmed not by just the number of cases that came in but by the severity of the cases if before number of patients in the you know maybe treatment centers you know uh, will be like maybe three to ten percent are having severe form of the disease but now severity is increasing and we're getting near uh, between 50 to uh, some places even 70 percent you know level of severity so which means the number of patients that we need you know uh, mechanized uh, life support you know like uh, ventilators oxygen is increasing uh, then uh, lastly is the fact that uh, if before this severity that we're now seeing uh, we used to see them mostly before in uh, elderly people but uh, some of the younger uh, people that are getting the infection are uh, coming down with uh, se severe c cases. So definitely we have evidence that something is strange about the virus. So we don't know yet like uh, what is established. This is the same thing that started happening in South Africa before they found a, you know, a new strain. Uh, as he mentioned, mutations occur in viruses. But when it reaches a stage, a, a new variant will come up. So that means it has mutated enough Then you have a, 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 a shift in the DNA, in the, in the gene material. So you get a, a, a new virus that is behaving strangely. Mm -hmm. So I think what we are trying to do now, we are trying to intensify our activity. In fact, I was just speaking with the national coordinator that we need to enhance our this thing to check whether definitely maybe we are dealing with a, a, a variant of a virus we don't know. Why? Mm -hmm. If there is a new variant in Britain and we didn't close our borders and people poured in a well, you, lot you from Britain you, you, you know you for talk. Christmas and others there's possibility that that this variant could have introduced uh, this is high mm -hmm. secondly you know uh, our molecular biology center in uh, Edie is the center of excellence for Africa it has seen evidence that we could be having this strain. so we need to intensify to see if really this strains uh, already you know in uh, in the making Okay, uh, Professor Nasidi, you know, they say visual memories, you know, stick to the human mind, which mm -hmm. is very complex. Mm -hmm. You know, during Ebola, which you were actively involved mm -hmm. in, you know, sort of containing it, people saw the graphic images of the blood and everything coming. Let's have a reality check here. Is it because we are not seeing patients in isolation centers on ventilators, oxygen and all that? Is that the reason why people are not believing that COVID-19 is real? Is that one of the reasons? I believe strongly it could be one of the reasons. But let me just say something. How do you convince somebody that is in danger? Somebody standing in the jungle, there's a lion, there's a snake, there's this thing. How will you convince him that he's really in danger if he doesn't see them? He doesn't see the lion, he doesn't see the snake. So I, there's what we call in public health risk communication. Mm. So it is that communicating to the people that there is danger around that we need to really you know try to intensify uh, the uh, uh, our strategy had not really emphasized seriously that aspect of our response so i think you know with these things happening now we might need to invest more in that area we're investing a lot in testing in surveillance which is excellent but that risk communication is uh, not there There's, secondly you know people don't believe uh, that you know they 
you wake up today, you are not sure if you reach evening, but you are so confident that, oh, you will, be, you will see 20, 20, 30. So the only thing that you could listen is when you start seeing people dying around you, then you get frightened. A good example is Italy. When this thing hit Italy, Italians are hot-blooded Europeans. They're like Africans. You know, they ignored, you know, uh, public uh, health uh, measures, the uh, non-pharmaceutical listen, where they ignored their government. And they didn't believe that the disease will, uh, what did they call it? In fact, they were embracing the Chinese. They are doing everything. They said, don't listen to the government. But when they started seeing deaths increasing, when a family would lose three, four, they didn't even have where to put dead body. Mm -hmm. Nobody told them to run back into their uh, flats and mm -hmm. started singing from the balconies with the masks. Mm -hmm. yes. So, you know, we don't want to reach that stage. You know, there's a saying that only fools learn from their own experience. We shouldn't allow that to happen to us. COVID-19 is real. Many, first and foremost, there is communication to many. More than 75% of Nigerians don't believe that there's COVID-19 or it is real. We will, we will we get to that. To that. Especially in the States. Yes, yes. especially in the States. Mm. We, will, we, will, we will deal with that. Luckily, we have two uh, COVID-19 uh, protocols and forces here. Mm -hmm. We have a Haru Atta here with us. We also have the Secretary to Plateau State Government who is also the coordinator of the tax force with us. But let's understand what we're dealing with. And that's why I'm going back to Professor Timitakwe Alonge, uh, who is the former chief medical director, University College Hospital, uh, chairman, technical tax force on COVID-19 or your state. Uh, Professor Nasidi has said something, that the virus is behaving strangely. And strangely so too, because uh, uh, Dr. Aliu, Sani Aliu says that um, we, we are seeing, well, he hasn't said that, but I think it was the PTF a chairman who gave you know his experience where um, a one year old within his household you know came down with a virus so it would appear that we are seeing you know um, we are recording more infections among the young ones the youth and all that what can you tell us about the transmission you know rates among citizens at, at this time uh, thank you very much I want to uh, support or actually align with uh, Dr. Liu and uh, Professor Nasidi. Um, in the past three weeks, we've had um, very nasty experiences regarding the um, ages at which these patients now present. But beyond that, the mortality, like Professor Nasidi also pointed out, is now um, more prevalent in younger people, 85-year-old, 47-year-old, uh, um, and even much younger. Um, we believe, we've been in, in touch with our colleague at EDE, and as I speak, the question is how many variants of this virus do we even have? Dr. Ali, you, you know, mentioned very clearly. Uh, this virus, particularly respiratory viruses, have the tendency to mutate. I mean, by the time they're replicating, it's technically impossible for them to go through the cycle of replication without having a, an error. And so mutation, new strains, it's not, it's not strange to us. But what is strange is that in the past three, four weeks, we've had high infectivity rate, we've had mortality increasing in the younger people, and we had many more people come for voluntary testing. You see, before there was a lot of appeal if you have these symptoms, NCDC revised, you know, the protocol for testing. We have many more people now voluntarily calling the EOC, asking to be tested. But after being tested, those who even come positive are asking to be hospitalized because now they know that the mortality is um, nothing to joke with. We've recorded three deaths in one week. That is very strange to your state, despite the fact that we do a lot of testing. And um, may I join my colleagues to say that I agree 100%. There's a lot of complacency amongst the citizenry. We also have mask fatigue, I believe. But most importantly is risk communication. Um, we've put a lot of effort. The PTF has done extremely well. And so is the NCDC. But the risk communication in Nigeria is unbelievably low. And so we've devised all manners of methods to try and get people to know that there is risk. And um, in your state, the um, governor uh, gave a mandate for touring of the 33 local government areas with two professors from the University of Ibadan. 
who are experts in epidemiology, uh, risk assessment and evaluation. And when they came back, it was a, a disaster. People just couldn't be bothered about these viruses. Again, I think illiteracy uh, plays a very vital role. Uh, but even among the literate community, people have now resorted to um, alternate methods of, in court prevention, taking medications and all of that. So I believe that that coupled with the fact that we don't have deaths uh, being picked on the streets like uh, um, one American did suggest, has given people this wrong notion that, um, you know, they don't have to bother too much. But I want to warn that, have we dealt with the virus, the, the Spanish flu of 1918? If people have that mindset, that we will have to learn to live with this virus, then people are going to be more cautious. Uh, so, for me, new strain, no strain, um, whatever it is that we're having, it's pretty worrisome. And we have to um, look for other methods of trying to increase uh, risk communication so that we can um, stem the tide of this particular virus. Professor, I'm still going to stay with you, Professor Temitope. You know, um, being close to Lagos, it's quite, you know, interesting to see that all your state numbers are not very high. And um, I believe it's due to your diligence in awareness and uh, following the, you know, safety protocols. You know, when the PTF introduced new measures, you know, about the protocols, the federal government said you sh the states should liaise with the PTF to ensure that protocols are followed to the latter. Some states are saying they do not take directives from the PTF, but from their state executives. What is the situation in Oyo State now? Oyo State is um, extremely compliant. Um, apart from governance at the various uh, levels, the people, all the, my colleagues in the studio are people that I know very well. And so we communicate uh, with each other, trying to find out what other things needed to be done. So outside of government protocols and rules, we still talk to each other to try and make sure that uh, we preserve the lives of citizens. Um, I don't know if you have access to a video that has gone viral uh, on the beach in Lagos. That is very disturbing. Um, let me confirm what you just said. In the past um, one month, there about there's been an influx of a lot of people from lagos uh, and i'm afraid uh, to ibadan just before christmas the population swelled to close to five six million and when you uh, confront people on the streets a lot of the people that are non-compliant amongst us were actually in court visitors who um probably do not um value um our approach of being patient and actually persuasive. That is the mode of action of the governor of, um, uh, executive governor of uh, your state, Engineer Shea Makinde. Persuasive willingness of the people to own their own action. That is our hashtag, own your own action. Now, enforcement and trying to bear down with a lot of force sometimes may not achieve what you actually want. And so he has taken it upon himself and through the task force to be very persuasive, radio jingles, television adverts. And so we are complying with the NCDC and PTF protocols. Remember that Oyo State was actually more or less at the forefront of this staggered um, resumption of schools when schools resumed. That is, we staggered, number one, the um, resumption for uh, the senior secondary school, those who are going to be exiting, and thereafter staggered, you know, junior and senior after, you know, the YEC exam and the, you know, final exit in primary school. So in terms of compliance, of course we do. We also give advice to the uh, people in government as well anyway, like I said, because we, we speak to each other outside of government protocols. So, uh, Alange, thank you. We'll return to you uh, presently. Uh, let's return to Jos, uh, Professor Nandade Atu, who is also the... Uh, Secretary to Plateau State Government and Coordinator Tax Force on COVID-19. Um, the National Coordinator, you know, said something funny earlier on. He said that the virus, you know, has had both Christmas and New Year gifts to latch on. That's why we're seeing 
uh, you know, these uh, search in, 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 in cases. And that also speaks to the points raised by uh, Professor Lange, Alonge and Professor Nasudi about complacency, fatigue, and risk communication. What's your story? Plateau has maintained a steady and comfortable third position on the state uh, COVID-19 you know, case chart. Our old Christmas gift, a new year gift, for maintaining that position. But uh, I must say that uh, here on the plateau, the situation is not different from uh, what has been reeled out by the coordinator, Dr. Liu, and uh, other stakeholders over there. It has been a very hectic exercise, and I know that uh, on the plateau, when the PTF reeled out new guidelines, the governor, who is the chairman of the task force himself, uh, convoked uh, a meeting of all critical stakeholders to enlighten them about the new protocols reeled out by uh, PTF, and to equally resensitize and come up with new uh, approach to creating awareness and addressing uh, the risk communication factors. And uh, I remember in that meeting, we unanimously agreed that uh, we should have shared responsibilities. Uh, in this shared responsibility, the idea is so that it will, it will cascade deep into the rural communities. Uh, the traditional rulers and other community leaders were assigned with the task of, of cascading the, 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 the message and the, and the guidelines down to the respective communities from the ward, village, district, and chiefdom levels. Uh, while the, the local government chairman, chairman were tasked with the, the responsibility of addressing the congregations at uh, motor parks, markets, and other areas where we have congestions, recreation, and so on. Now, the, the religious leaders we are tasked with the, with, the, with, the, with the responsibility of indicating their, their, their followers in their respective churches and monks. Because we envisage, the governor envisaged that we are going to have upsurge of visitors during the holy Yulitite. And uh, we know, you know that uh, Abuja normally during Yulitite is always empty. Most of them flung to Kaduna, to Joss, and so on for their Yulitite. And so we envisage that one. And so we felt that uh, the, the message should go deep into the communities. And just yesterday, we, 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 we equally called again for another meeting to assess the level of compliance. And uh, what we have noticed is that uh, we are faced with uh, some negative perceptions based on the poor we got. Uh, we've had some, some who will now tell you that this thing is, uh, is, 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 is a mirage. It's not really real because they have gone, they've gone through, they didn't feel anything. Uh, they are not seeing any, any effect on their bodies and so on. And uh, someone will tell you that, uh, that even the, 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 so the, that the proposed vaccine that is coming, uh, the, the proposed vaccine is, is another attempt to wipe away the population of, uh, of, of, of the state. Uh, so such, such reports we got uh, actually gave us another impetus of resistance again to move forward. And the governor has directed that uh, from next week, the all government officials, all members of the House of Assembly, and uh, a stakeholders will go out to the, current, to the communities themselves, to our respective communities. The idea is to join hands with community leaders, religious leaders, and uh, transport uh, uh, workers so that to further indicate the populace on that. Because, it, you see, the, the behavioral change is something that uh, if you actually want to achieve, it has to be continuous. Uh, yes, I agree with the fact that uh, there's a lot of fatigue, particularly among the health workers. But it's something that we, need. we have to reject and re encourage them all the time, from time to time. Uh, we are very passionate about that. Our schools, for instance, we are, we are pro the schools were proposed to reopen on the 4th of January. But because of uh, the PTF guidelines, uh, we have shifted that one to, to, to comply with the guidelines of the PTF. And uh, these are some of the things. Now, the, the fascinating thing about uh, the new upsurge is the fact that the, the rate of death has increased on the plateau. Uh, between, between March and, uh, and November 2020, we recorded a total of 32 deaths. Now, 32, 34, 34, sorry. Now, but between December alone, 
December to this, to this day, we have recorded well over 12 deaths. So that's that tell you the options. And uh, as I speak with you, quite a number of people are on ventilators now. And uh, that, 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 that speaks of the, 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 the calamity that awaits us. Now, what the, what the chairman of the task force, who is the governor himself, has directed that uh, during this uh, committee engagement with the communities, that we are going to, to, to involve those, the survivors of the COVID-19, so that they can tell their story. We want them to tell the story so that other people will get to know the severity of what they went through. Uh, the governor himself has not even uh, shied away from telling his own story. Uh, I remember during the during, during occasions he have had call to, to tell the story said that what he went through, he would not even wish his enemies to, to go through it. Uh, that has helped to 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 to, 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 to instill the message in the minds of the people. So on the plateau, we are nourishing on our own, and uh, we have discovered too that uh, using kinetic approach only gives artificial responses from the people. Uh, we remember when we were using this kinetic to enforce it, stopping people to enforce it, and uh, taxi drivers will even borrow uh, uh, masks to give to give to their patients to, to, to their passengers. Now you give the masks in the, the, the car when you when you are latching out of the, the cars, you they, they collect it and give it to new passengers. So all of this, we have, we discovered that one, and uh, the best approach we felt that is that people should own up to it. Uh, that is the message we are continuously uh, invoking on our people. That. Professor Nladia, too, you know, you've you've raised some, you know, issues there. People borrowing face masks, you know, to use, which is very, very dangerous. And I'm sure, you know, we've heard the governor of Plateau State being on his toes, you know, trying to, uh, you know, uh, flatten the curve of COVID-19 in Plateau State. And so many measures has been put in place. But still, like uh, Claire said, you are still comfortable third on the list. Let's now come back to the studio, mm, Mr. Ikarato. You have been out there every day. We see you on TV all the time trying to raise awareness on the dangers of the new variant of COVID-19. What is your experience like and what is the ac acceptability of people on your awareness campaign? Yes, I think we, we try and be a little bit very bold and very tough on this. I'm uh, not leaving it uh, to Dr. Aliu and the SGF, Mr. Boss Mustafa, to do the daily talking, giving us uh, daily, I want to call it now, daily, daily guide, daily information as it involves uh, COVID-19, the new strain and the new strain and the second wave going forward. My experience is not very palatable. Let me put that uh, in the first place. I shared that with uh, Dr. Aliu outside before we walked into the studio. That let's take, for instance, the Christmas and the New Year. He made a very vital point here that COVID-19 had a very nice Christmas going through enjoying itself uh, through the New Year with people uh, passing it through. We, we actually shut down some very key uh, parks and centers in the FCT. And when you shut down one place, thinking that persons will go home, you gather them in group, you talk to them. The next thing, they go to another place and they, the crowd becomes more than thanks. Ten of what you want to solve. You shut down maybe Jabi Lake, you found them, move to a closer mall. You shut down the uh, Millennium Park, the Unity Fountain, where they gather in their thousands. They move somewhere else. You shut down one or two. And you keep seeing persons in extreme search uh, for pleasure and for passion here. And we try at all time to talk to talk with them but what we should also bear in mind is the news that we actually sign on to actually herald this interview session here where the journalist asks a question at the end why is it so difficult for persons who travel out to other civilizations and uh, obey the law worship the laws of other countries come into this country and have to wait for the ptf to put them on travel ban it is because we need to be a little bit more tough yes we must go on advocacy yes we must communicate yes we must discuss yet we must engage them but we must be a little bit tough and tell those persons that you can't obey law outside and you come here and you break the law all these are what most times we see here and if i may touch a little to what was raised about risk communication i say it i said it here as early as april this year that we cannot talk about a patient rights in all totality and expect people to believe when this virus i was in wuhan we all saw that when it moved to europe we were seeing that so when the virus came in here and we were actually guided uh, by the sga mr Bob mustafa and dr ali who is here we all panicked in march we panicked in april and twice may we started disbelieving the system here 
we must try as much as possible to allow people see what is happening in the ICU. I was privileged uh, to go around with Dr. Kao and the FCTA Permanent Secretary Olushade and you saw many persons on oxygen here and I told them we must keep this, we must keep these videos and others running for people to believe. Then we must tackle agents of disbelief, no matter how powerful they are. We've seen clerics tell people in large number in their millions that look, COVID-19 is not real. We see people say, look, this vaccine is to initiate a new world order the mark of the beast 666 which i and we all here believe is not true we must speak up to it here we've seen governors come on air grant live interview destroy all what the ptf is doing make people not to believe in the process we must also voice out very strongly that these are mere deceptions here if we don't come at tough when those on the other part are coming out of here, no matter what we say, no matter how we push, we'll find persons strongly disbelieving what we are all struggling to, to do to save people's lives. I share with Dr. Aliu, I keep referring to him here, because they're the ones who guide us at the national mm. level here, that go to Guru Cemetery in Abuja, go to the Christian part and the Muslim part, just take a look at the fresh graves you will see this morning. They may all not be COVID, but I went there severally because I love taking time out from the enforcement to just stay around because it's a, in a very busy area here, to look at the increase increasing number of the graves and I, what I have seen throughout December period to January I always get worried that no matter what it is this increasing number of fresh graves and that may be slightly or somehow tied to COVID so the experience is not very good here mm. persons just want to be stubborn but we must we must be tough because if yeah. we are on this side we relax and just when people we can't win the battle against uh, the second wave of COVID-19 we you, must and must be tough you know you know I Ikaru thank you and, and you have touched on a very sensitive aspect of our conversation and that has to do with the category of people who flout our who flout the protocol rules mm -hmm. and before we bring in the national coordinator to speak to us it, it would appear from all indications that we are dealing with this issue with kid gloves in terms of enforcement and uh, you know com co uh, enforcing compliance with the rules but for you Ikaro I just like for you to tell us what category of people generally flout the protocol rules. I think from my own observation here, it, it will be all class. The rich, the poor, they have and they have not. Everyone flout the rules. The ones we talked about during the Christmas period that we actually had to chase out from the Millennium Park, the Unity Fountain, the Jabi Lake Park, and they had to move elsewhere, and we are crowding. These were largely poor persons here. Sometimes uh, some of them even had to cry that we're just doing nothing but destroying the Christmas and destroying the New Year. But for but, them, for, but, sorry, but for them, that will be out of ignorance. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with them. But for the, for the very elite, yeah, I, most, most persons who are the very elite, the very big one. You agree with me. Some very big persons in government throw parties. The birthday parties are uh, extreme, highly congested uh, marriage parties. We all watch all of this and we get so worried here. Those ones also flout the rules. Even some, with your apology, some security personnel also, when we go around to enforce compliance in parks and gardens, shutting down many, we shot four yesterday, uh, it's very much in the news. You find that you go there, you meet some persons who are law enforcement agents who ought by themselves, and like what the Commissioner of Police, uh, uh, Balachi Roma, have told us, anyone you meet who is, an, who is a law enforcement agent, you get that person as well apprehended. Then you go to all the cycle of society, even the clerics. Even the clerics who are custodians of the divine law urging us to obey mortal laws and allow government to run. Most times you go to churches, you go to mosques, you go to some other worship places, they violate the rules almost completely. And when you want to touch them, people tell you, oh, you are an antichrist, you are against Islam, you are against this. And they don't say the fact that these persons are endangering life. Sometimes you go to market, people tell you, oh, no, just allow us to do our thing here. We are hungry and we need to live. So okay. at every feed here, you see persons breaking the law. Thank you, Ikaro. <laughs> Let's bring in now the national coordinator. coordinator yeah. um, hundred persons on the travel restriction list. These are not just, um, as uh, Ikaro said, you know, um, ordinary people. ordinary Nigerians. Nigerians. These are you know high-profile Nigerians, and we've also seen different countries come down hard, take very stringent measures, mm -hmm. you know, to to check spread. Uh, but it would appear that we are dealing with it, you know, with the kid, I mean, kid gloves. We, we, we are um, co conservative with, you know, enforcement, isn't Would it appear so? So, Claire, the, when we opened flights in September, we made it very clear to people that if you do not, if you do not follow the protocol, there will be, there will be repercussions. And we kept on 
we kept on mentioning the fact that we will put travel restrictions for passengers that continue to flout our protocol. There are, we have a large number of the Nigerian elite that are currently in Dubai on holiday. You cannot go outside a hotel in Dubai without wearing a mask. You can't. If you go out, they will, they will, they, 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 they will, um, they will put, they will penalize you. You will be fined mm. straight away. Initially, three thousand five hundred dirhams. Now I understand about five thousand dirhams. That's a lot so of money. why should you obey another country's law? And then meanwhile, you come to your own country and you put your own countrymen and women at risk. It's simple. So, Enforcement. Mm. Yeah, they get so, punished. So uh, you talk about kid gloves. Well, the gloves are off now. We've given people enough time. We have pleaded. We have told people we will do this. But people have continued to fly. We have over 20,000 people that have not followed our protocol, which is very simple. You test before you come into the country so that we are fairly certain of your status at the time of arrival. Because of the incubation period, you stay at home for seven days. It used to be 14 days, yeah. but we realize it's very difficult to keep people at home for 14 days. Then you repeat the test at day seven. A lot of the countries that are now placing restriction, they are following the very same protocol that we started in September. Mm. We said, okay, you test at day seven. If you're negative, you exit. 20,000 people. We've had to take the first 100. The reason why we took 100 was because we had to call each and every one of the 100 and find out, and find out whether truly did they do the test or not. And if they didn't do the test, why didn't they do the test? Was it a system issue back in September? Therefore, they are not at fault, etc. We tried to be fair and just to everybody. What, I had what, to go through what, that list. What, but that list, Claire, yes. is only the first 100. From now on, every week, we will publish another 100 and we will restrict them, their travel. You until publish without names? Yes. So that's what we call confidentiality. Okay. We, we don't want to point fingers. What we are trying to do is to change people's behavior. As Prof said, it's all about risk communication, but also engagement with the community. But, but, this, but these, are the issues that, that, these are the issues that Ikaro mentioned. Yes. We, are, we, are, we are, you know, this is not an issue that we should treat. You yes, know. But, but what do, you, what do we want to do? We want to change people's behavior. We've shown that we are going to do it. We've done it. And we will continue doing it every week until things change. It's not like we want to punish people. But if you continue to put okay. our country at risk, the gloves are off. We will take action. Next week, we will publish another 100. Next week, subsequent weeks, we'll continue to publish until we see an improvement in terms of the compliance. So whether you are a VIP, whether you are a government official, whether you are in a leadership position, if you do not follow the travel protocols, there will be repercussions. We do not publish names because the essence of doing the entire exercise is to force people to comply with our protocol. They've seen the 100. Those 100, each one is an individual with a life of his, his or her own. But there are people that will not be able to travel for six months because of what they have, they have done. And we've worked very closely with immigration. Initially, we were holding on to passports at the airport. But it was impossible. We had 160,000, 60 something thousand people coming in between September and now. We have sometimes up to 5,000 people coming in a week. You cannot keep passports uh, at the airport and ask people to go and do a test and come back at day seven. Passports will start getting lost, etc. So the only way was to go down the technology route, electronic, and put limitations on the use of that passport for a period of time. We wish we didn't have to. That was why we delayed until December. We had to make sure that, yes, definitely, people are not following the protocol, definitely. Only about half of people coming into the country, only about 50%, even bother to go onto the travel portal and pay for the test at day seven. Of those that pay, one third, one out of three. And it's not small money. It's 39,500 for Abuja. It's not small money, but you still go ahead. You pay 39,500 for a service. All you need to do is to go to that lab that morning, having been reminded the day before that you have a test, have the sample taken. If you are negative, you exit. So they are reminded, but they are some, reminded. some people are saying that they were not reminded, they were not called. Well, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I have, I, have, I have very good evidence. At the beginning, the first month in September, we did have problems with the protocol, but the system is working now. We have over 20 laboratories now throughout the country that are involved with the travel protocol. 
we know that the portal works, but only 50% or less use it. So for South Africa and UK travelers now, you cannot even board without going onto the portal, um, filling the health questionnaire, uploading your COVID PCR result and paying for the test. That's for South Africa and the UK. We're going to extend this very soon. So in the future, you will not even be able to get onto a flight to come back to Nigeria without using the travel portal and when you are exiting because of the issue of fake certificates we are going to we are going to force passengers to uh, those that require a test because by the way not every country requires a test if you are traveling out so again let, let me make this clear do not waste your money to do a covid test on your way out if you don't need to you need to check with the airline and the embassy of the country where you are going to. But if you need a COVID PCR test in order to stop this issue of fake results, you have to go onto the portal. You pay, you go to the lab, you will print out a QR code. That QR code number will have to match the laboratory result you have when you are exiting. If people don't follow protocols, do we need a law to drum it in? So a lot of the states do have um, edicts. Um, if you remember March, April, that they, they applied um, with regards to non-pharmaceutical interventions, face masks, um, et cetera. And we are not now looking at the national level uh, in terms of having a similar, a similar edict. But what we know is that we, we have to work with the states. Nigeria has a federal system. As you said earlier on, we advise the states to delay opening the schools until the 18th of January. It's not because we want to continue having our children at home. No, this is common sense. The numbers are going up. The children, there will be children who will be colonized because of their parents. With all this partying, etc. And then you give them an opportunity to come together, and then they go back home and they spread this. This is common sense. The PTF provides a baseline. We provide the minimum. And then we expect state governments to do that minimum and possibly do even more to enforce. And we're very pleased. FCT, Kaduna, Lagos, they are doing what they're supposed to do. Even Rivers, clearly they're doing what they're supposed to do in terms of enforcement, etc. We cannot do everything at the federal level. It's impossible. I cannot go to every hotel in the country and make sure that everybody is wearing a face mask. Mm. I cannot close every, every night bar or club, etc. But... In the same way that the federal government is interested in saving people's lives, I am very sure no state governor will do the opposite. Every state governor would also have the interest of his or her people. That's what government is all about. And okay. we have to work together. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Ali, just before we, we leave you and bring in other guests, I'd, I'd, I'd like to find out if the 100 people uh, that are now placed on you know, travel restriction ban, uh, did we try to find out the reason why they didn't turn up for, for tests? That, that's one. And secondly, uh, I, I've heard stories where people ha who, who have uh, dual citizenship also have dual passports. And some of these hundred persons may well have dual you know, passports. And you place restriction on one, they could easily use the other passport and check out. So how would you ensure that this, uh, the impact of the restriction ban, you know, is felt. Uh, so uh, we don't have, um, uh, we cannot place restrictions on a foreign passport. But Claire, if you have dual citizenship and you leave Nigeria with a UK passport, you'll not be able to come back with a UK passport. You will need to use your Nigeria passport or go for a visa. It's the same immigration that you will go for in, in the UK high, co in the Nigeria High Commission in the UK to get a visa. So you'll not be able to come back. So, and if you are leaving, uh, fine. Uh, we know we cannot restrict you from leaving because you have another travel document. But certainly when you are coming back, you have to stay there for at least six months. And I don't think a lot of people will want to go to Britain now because they are <laughs> under lockdown unless you want to go there and read books that you haven't read for a long time. Mm. So, yes, there are things that we can do and there are things that are within our control. We wish we didn't have to take that action on the first 100. But we had to because clearly people were not following our protocol and were putting us in danger. From now on, the gloves are off. Every week we will publish 100, but we'll keep on monitoring the compliance. And the moment or we notice... more than 100 if possible. Yes, the main limitation for the 100 is because of what we have to do. Every phone call we tape. We actually have a taped conversation with the person, with the person that's um, involved, because we know people's livelihoods are at risk, etc. And we don't want to punish people who clearly did not 
it was not it wasn't their fault etc okay um, Tali, let, let's put you on hold like, and take a short take, break. Yeah, short break right now when we return the conversation continues all right welcome back if you've just tuned in you're watching good morning niger and the network service um we're looking at COVID 19 resurgence and uh, protocols enforcement we have our guests here in the studio but let's uh, take our question to professor timmy talk uh who is joining us via zoom uh let, let's let's look at the um, risk communication because you, you mentioned that earlier on and you said it was low. At the at the outbreak of, of the virus of the pandemic, uh, the national approach was take responsibility. Uh, well, at its at the time, it came down to take responsibility, and you know, state uh, government were asked to also um, you know get involved in 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 checking the spread, the community spread. How would you evaluate, um, I know you've talked about this earlier on when Jume asked you, but at a national level, some states are beginning to take their own uh, decisions in terms of uh, protocols. How would you say this is impacting on the national response? Apparently, um, what you've said is actually, um, one of my major concerns um, regarding this uh, pandemic. What the PTF is doing um, excellently is to have a coordinated approach. But of course, states are given the privileges of um, probably using their local content or their behave the behavior of the citizenry of their states to try and modify. But that is not to say that any state has the mandate to disobey um, the template as provided by the uh, PTF and of course following the protocols of the NCDC. Um, 27th of April 2020 was when the first isolation and treatment center was commissioned in New York State and it was in conjunction with the uh, DG NCDC, uh, Dr. Chikwe Ikwazu himself. And of course at the meeting it was clear that we we're going to be um, you know, abiding strictly by the protocols from both the PTF and also the NCDC. Uh, I believe that states that have not uh, complied have actually provided an avenue for escapes of various cases. If you remember the initial lockdown and the various borders were supposed to be closed, people came in and used all manners of devices to import the diseases. We had um, an incident where a lorry load full of people were intercepted. Um, and when they were tested, I think about four out of 16 were positive for coronavirus. And one of them uh, during the interview did say that, well, he didn't think he was going to get good treatment from his state. That is why he came down to your state. Um, some people came in from Lagos pretending to be market women. They entered trucks and... Um, petrol tankers, um, just to be able to escape, you know, the checks. And so my, my take is that the PTF and NCDC are doing a, a great job. And there must be collaboration between the states. I just gave you, what is it called now, and a hint about what transpired in Lagos. I'm sure Dr. Ali would have seen that video. And he, my friend, um, uh, Atta, will have um, been shuddering probably, you know, uh, when he saw that video in Lagos, the beaches, I mean, you could, you look through for almost two, three, four miles. I mean, huge number of people who just refused to comply. And then you ask yourself, are we not communicating? Atta did say that people should be allowed to enter into intensive care units to see patients on ventilators. In New York State, we've actually brought people to come and speak life those who were in the isolation centers, what they went through. Now we have families in isolation centers. I don't think, you know, the PTF has actually requested for us to submit the data. It would be nice if, the, you know, we have a national data. Apart from community transmission, we now have inbreeding within families. In one of our isolation centers in New York State now, we have a family, the husband, unfortunately the wife passed on, from coronavirus. So the husband and the children are in the isolation centers because not only were they infected, their CT values were so low that they themselves were a risk to people around them. 
And so I believe that we need a national coordination, uh, like the PTF and Talib said, enforcing and um, clamping down and coming hard on people may not achieve our aims. But I think we need to have a national uh, meeting of coordinators of this particular program um, under the PTF so that we can express ourselves um, clearly. And if there are areas where people feel there's overbearing influence, because you cannot have governance um, without control, I believe the PTF is giving templates, and I believe that we need to comply. But if there are areas where you need clarification, I believe that Dr. Aliu and his team can actually bring people together from the various states and let them explain themselves. If there are areas uh, of disagreement or areas where you think you need to be assisted, um, I was glad when we had challenges with, um, you know, uh, uh, test kits. We approach PTF and NCDC, and within the space of 24 hours, they were coming in with courier services. This is just to let you know that the coordination is good, but there are some states, unfortunately, that are uh, probably not complying as much as they should. And I think um, PTF um, is doing the right thing by persuading them, which is what we do in terms of risk communication. But there might be, you know, uh, reasons to um, put in some measures, just like, um, you know, uh, the 100 passports that have been cited. So for each state, I believe there should be some decorum. And I think Dr. Aliu has the power to summon uh, the incident managers of various states if they find that these states are lacking behind in, uh, in their responsibilities. So much, Professor Alonge. Let's now join Professor Anladi Atu in Plateau State. Um, you know, Plateau is the hub of enjoyment in the north, in the northern <laughs> part of Nigeria. You know, people just go to Plateau to have fun because of the scenery, the food, and you know the the you know pe the people there. So, Professor Temutepe is calling for a meeting with the national, that is the PTF, and um, collection of data of people who have died or who are down with COVID nineteen. You were talking. You were talking earlier about you know awareness in the villages with the villagers and everything. But what are you doing apart from the awareness in enforcing these safety protocols in Plateau State so that they, you, you know you can flatten the curve? Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I was on a lot of when I said that uh, we are, it was our new year and gift for being taught. But you see, beyond that level, you notice that uh, there's correlation between the level of testing you do and, uh, and, and, and the, record, the, 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 the rate of positivity you record in your state. Now, I endorse what Prof said about uh, the need for, for us to have a kind of a, uh, a synergy by, by sharing ideas. Let's have a kind of peer review. Because there are quite a number of things that uh, the PTF may learn from us at a macro level that may be a little bit unique, which uh, can be incorporated into the national uh, guidelines. Uh, so such a meeting, I think, is important. Now, you, you, you alluded to the fact that, yes, Plateau State is, uh, is a home of tourism. And uh, people come in for uh, a lot of how to catch phone and so on, mountaineering and so on. Now, what we, what we have done is to ban all of this. Because we notice that uh, such gatherings are uncontrollable. Uh, particularly during the unit time, we ban all aspects of, uh, of, of uh, recreations. We, born, we ban all aspects of mountaineering and so on. So all such social functions, we ban them. Uh, because it's very difficult for us to control the enforcement of these protocols in that order. Uh, of course, we witness some, some, some defined uh, uh, approaches. People define all of these protocols, uh, define even our orders. Uh, what we did was to actually uh, enforce, use, use, use some elements of uh, enforcement to, to, to ensure that people do not participate in that. Now, we, by next week, you begin to see uh, our approach will be prosecution, 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 and of course, uh, people have, because people take it for granted. Uh, there will going to be executive order. The, 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 the governor, who is the chairman of the task force, is going to sign an executive order to enable us to prosecute. Uh, it's been alluded to that in Dubai, people pay uh, heavily for that. So we will be seen to be doing that one. 
because like it, it appears as if uh, Nigerians seem to uh, like the, the, the high handedness. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a polite approach to it. So we, we would like to uh, embark on prosecution, prosecution of uh, uh, people who defile our orders. Beyond that one too, as I said, we, we, have, been, we have a challenge, and the only challenge are some of the, uh, what is trending in the social media. You see key government officials, people who are like our leaders, who begin to tell you that this thing is not real. And even in their state, they are saying that they are not testing because it does not exist. Uh, so we have been confronted with that one in the field. People say, ah, you told us that COVID-19 is this, is this, is so, but here, these our leaders are saying this, so which one do we believe? I think so, we, I think there's a need to have a concerted effort of approaching our leaders, some of our leaders, who will tell their followers that it does not exist. Perhaps it will help us. We need to call some of them to order, uh, use, particularly uh, at the national level. It's important for you to, for us to begin to engage them because uh, as, as they speak, it runs from everywhere. So we are confronted with that challenge. Uh, the second major challenge we are being confronted with is the fact that uh, some states up to now are not testing as they ought to be. And uh, particularly if, 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 if they are our neighbors and you discover that they, 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 they come in into, into plot to air all the time, and of course, that again is adding to the challenge we have. And uh, for us to begin to enforce that when they come in and people see them, uh, it, it, to them is very strange. So these are some of the challenges we are faced with at the moment. Thank you, Professor Atu. Uh, let's hopefully we will have a chance to uh, get your closing remarks. But right here in the studio, I'd like to bring in Professor Nasidi and uh, Iharu Atta uh, to take this question. Um, there are, in the minds of Kogi, uh, the people of Kogi, COVID 19 <clears throat> does not exist. Uh, well, most people. <laughs> <laughs> My sister here, in the minds of most people from Kogi State, the COVID-19 does not exist. And we've seen uh, distinguished former senator himself come out to, you know, video himself, you know, calling on people not to, um, you know, get the vaccine when they do, it does get to us. Uh, so at, at the outbreak, when this pandemic was treated as a public health issue, there was a national coordination and we saw you know, the impact, we started flattening the curve. At a stage, the national, the PTF, now decentralized coordination and asked state governments to take responsibility. At that point, we begin to see the weakness of the health infrastructure at the state level. Professor Nasi, do you think we can afford to decentralize approach at this time now? Well, uh I thought you should have asked the national coordinator to answer that no, question. I'll get but an independent good. opinion first. Okay, yes. well, it's, it's uh, important that uh, we raise it. Actually, I was trying to say, you know, generally, you know, not just decentralizing. Even if you may allow me just to talk about, you know, uh, what is causing the super spread in the country and so on and so forth and how we can come about it. Then we talk about the coordination. And the coordination uh, issue is the fact that uh, you know, it's not going to be possible for us to win this war without central command. We need central command system. In a federal system where the state governors are so powerful and they, they are alpha and omega in their states, whatever they say is what happens, except they fall in, you know, and they really, you know, support the activities at the federal level and take their people along, the limit to go are wasting our time. Uh, meetings, 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 we have passed that stage now. We are now at a level, in fact, our actions should be determined by the alert level we are. The alert level we are, even though we don't have enough information to determine it fully, does not give us time anymore for complacency or for waiting or for meetings and so on and so forth. The coordination I would like to, you know, uh, uh, you know agitate for should be the one that Mr. President is in charge and is commanding these state governors to fall in. If that doesn't happen, I'm appealing. Mr. President has to control some of the state governors. We are very proud of some of them. They are doing very well. But if one or two or three are not falling in, then leave me to God, we are wasting our time. We shall kill, quench the fire here, and then the fire will keep on spreading there. Coordination, central command system is very, very important. Then lastly, you know, uh, the, the, the states, 
that are not really performing very well don't have any reason not to. Because the federal, you know, everybody had so much money had been given to the states. And unfortunately, the actions, the, the number of tests in the, our response, the surveillance is mm -hmm. not enhanced, it's not commensurate with the amount of money already released to the states. Mm -hmm. So if you are now talking of meetings this one, without addressing those issues and saying accountability, that's my second point. Accountability is so crucial. And nobody can call them to account except Mr. President. The national coordinator can't. He can't you know, command the, st the state governors. Neither does the chairman of the uh, PTF. I know they are st struggling and all this, thing, but let's now face the fact. The fact is that we need the state governors to really take charge, to work with the federal government, to make sure that this war we are fighting is a real war. This disease is really is killing people. We are just hearing about the big men that are dying. Only God knows how many of the so-called deaths that are malaria and are really due to this uh, disease. Okay, Professor Nasidi, Ekaro Atta, can you respond to Claire's question now? Well, Briefly. I think, I think from our own point of view here, we need to be uh, very firm. We need a national coordination, and I think the PTF, as, uh, PTF uh, the combination of uh, Mr. Boss Mustafa and Dr. Aliu, they are giving that. We will... Always, when we join hands together as a people, uh, a united brand would defeat whatever is coming. And I, let, let, let me also touch uh, what uh, Dr. Joss raised here. We must change the narrative and the conversation in the media. This is not a big man sickness. It's not a big man, big man disease. Let's, let's get that running here. And many thanks to Alibaba, who yesterday actually put out some video and post around social media telling his own story. Uh, broadcast journalist, whom you know very well, Lara Wei Weiss, had also told her story uh, how she happens to actually go through COVID. And like what we said, let's start to target the poor. Many poor persons are dying here. And if we're able to change the conversation from the very rich, that dominates the headline and take it to the masses who are suffering from COVID, then the people will start to believe. But from our own end here, generally what I think is up for us to do, if a state governor is seeing that, why, why do you lie? Or why do you engage in, in, in what I would call deceit, telling people not to? I believe strongly that many persons in Kogi believe that COVID-19 is real. I have many of them who are my friends in Lokoja, some in Abuja here. If COVID-19 is not real, then uh, a very prominent man who was moved from the state to Abuja that passed on may so rest in peace would not have come here to seek for help. I believe COVID-19 is real. I believe all of us must keen as a people here. And I believe the president and commander-in-chief should not carry whip. To whip the governor into line, we must all join together, solve this problem once and for all, restore the economy back, and yes. develop the country going forward. Okay, Karata, um, Sam Nigel, we thank you so much for your observation there. And um, we have some tweets that came in. We quickly read them. As always, we tell you to make your tweets as short as possible and to the point so that we can have time to take them. We begin with Daily Jack Solomon from what we have seen so far. Nigerians aren't observing the COVID-19 guidelines too well. We must be informed that these guidelines, especially simple steps like wearing personal protective equipment, maintaining social distancing and physical distancing, and frequenting washing hands are key to staying safe and alive. All right. First, Mr. Kimbo Ewa says it's not clear that COVID protocols were backed by legislation <laughs> that will go through a lot of process. Yes. But this may be the reason why majority of Nigerians ignore the protocols. No, I don't think so. We're just not, we're just too complacent for, for, you know, not should come up with a COVID-19 legislation that will make it easier for law enforcement agencies to enforce the protocols. While a travel ban of 100 passengers who shun post-survival COVID test is welcome. Time for a robust enforcement of COVID protocols across our country if we must tackle the spread of the virus. And Ajani Olatunde Olur. Olua, Olua. Enforcement will be really difficult. Many Nigerians are suspicious of foul play with COVID figures, hence the reason for low compliance. Our government needs to decisively work at raising the trust level of the government. All right, Suleiman Babaga now is talking about uh, the comfort that the discovery of vaccine, you know, uh, has given to the world. He says it has reduced the tension created uh, uh, between those in authority and the populace in terms of strict enforcement of the protocols. And Nandam Weir tweets, as the pandemic continues, governments, emergency services, security agencies, and religious organizations are focusing on immediate needs, boosting capacity in hospitals, addressing insecurity, hunger, protecting firms and families from eviction and bankruptcy. I believe that if we are all of one mind and one voice, then we'll be able to overcome not only the COVID, but other matters arising. God bless Nigeria. Motona Farouk, COVID-19 protocols enforcement seems to be very hectic. 
hectic due to the disconnect uh, between leaders and the masses. Good governance itself enforces law and order than law enforcement agents. Nigerians are law-abiding citizens and the government should be closer to the people. And you know, Claire, we're running out of time, so mm. we, we need to thank Thomas, Leo Fadaka, Law IFC, Mike Anyako, Steve Bond 007. Well, you see, there's one here, uh, uh, Jimmy, Steve mm. Bond 007. It says, it's more of a personal okay. responsibility. Some wear the face mask just to gain an entry to a building, but put it off immediately after entrance. And I think he made sadly. it very, mm. very sadly. valid, sadly, very valid. Day. So let's take a last uh, question you know, from uh, the national coordinator, uh, PTF. We've talked about change, changing our risk communication uh, narrative. You know, how do we do this? Are you considering, or is the PTF considering um, raising more youth advocates? To enlighten their plans? Is that a, is that a consideration? So, so yes, um, uh, everybody is welcome in this fight against uh, COVID-19. Uh, back in April, May, we started reaching out to community leaders, uh, our religious leaders, traditional institutions. Uh, remember, we've had um, experience of this with the, with polio vaccine and with the polio vaccine issue back um, about 15 years ago. The thing is, if I come out to the public or any government official comes out to the public and says you need to do A, B, C in terms of your risk perception and changing your behavior, mm -hmm. I'm less likely to be followed by somebody that they live with and they see every day, such as a local leader, etc. So we will continue to put out that community engagement um, in terms of risk communication. But I think one thing that's really important that, that people need to realize is COVID is real. A anybody who says to me that COVID is not real, I challenge that person to go to our hospitals and see, there are people um, uh, um, uh, under ventilation at the moment. It's a terrible way to die if you're dying from COVID because you're practically suffocating. You're not getting enough oxygen. The virus is destroying your lung. It's really a very painful death. Yes, we don't know whether you're going to be in one of two spectrum because if you catch COVID, you could have a very mild illness, but you could also have a very severe illness. And there's nothing within you that will predict whether you're going to have the mild illness or the severe illness. So it's almost like playing Russian roulette. You will only know that after you have caught COVID. Speak to the people that have had COVID. Some of our governors have come out very clearly and they've spoken. Some of them have told me that they've never been that sick in their lives. It's not an illness that you would want. So when it comes to protection, my plea to the public is whoever you meet, Assume that that person has COVID. Whoever you meet, in other words, wear a face mask, keep off your physical distance, and it should be socially unacceptable for people to go out in public without a mask. Because we need to protect ourselves and we need to protect each other. It's and really important. Note, yes, mm -hmm. we, and that note, we need to thank you, Dr. Sani Ali, PTF National Coordinator. As always, your input is well, well, well respected. And we also thank Professor Abdusalami Nasidi, former DG, NCDC, and Provost College of Health Sciences, University of Africa, Bielsa State. Thank you so much for your contribution on the discourse. Thank you. Also in our studio, Ikaro Atta, Head of Media and Enlightenment, FCT Enforcement Tax Force on COVID-19, will be seeing from time to time on Good Morning Nigeria to give us clarification on how this, the, you know, the protocols is being carried out and how people are adhering to the safety protocols. Joining us via Zoom was Professor Temitope Alonge, former Chief Medical Director, University College Hospital, and now Chairman Technical Tax Force on COVID-19 on your state. Thank you so much for your insight into the topic. Also from JOS, Professor Danladi Atu, Secretary to Plateau State Governor and Coordinator Tax Force on COVID-19. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. That's Good Morning Nigeria for today. Do join us again tomorrow for the continuation of our review. I am Juma Yusuf. I am Claire Dilabu Abdul Razak and as we always say, keep safe and sure you abide by the COVID-19 safety protocols. From all of us here, bye-bye.